Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third edition of the Agile 100 online conference. Today, unfortunately, my co-host Zuzi is not with me, at least not for now. She's stuck in a hotel where she's desperately waiting to get a room and then have the bandwidth to participate as a host. But I've already get a clit uh, guard with me on stage. She will be our very first speaker, and I will give a brief introduction very, very soon. Now, let's go very quickly to our first speaker, Gitte. Gitte and I met many, many years ago at one of those Agile events. I, I don't remember whether it was a coach camp or a trainer's camp, etc. We've stayed in touch on and off, and we've seen each other at many conferences where both of us have been speakers. And when Zuzi and I thought about setting up the Agile 100 online conference, we immediately thought about having Gitte as one of our speakers fairly soon. So this time in, uh, in our third edition, we're really happy to host her. And um, with no further ado, Gitte, the stage is yours. I will turn off my camera and join back when you're done with your presentation for the Q&A. Thank you. Um, so hello and welcome. Thank you for spending time here. Um, we do spend a lot of time online and that's part of what I'm going to talk about today. So the theme for today is psychological safety and mental health in times of crisis. So this is uh, me and why I'm talking about this. So I'm an agile coach um, and a lot of the things I work with is psychological safety, it's communication, it's collaboration. Though I also work with other things uh, more, you know, um, implementing strategies and of course always retrospectives because that's one of our most important tools. But uh, one of my um, personal interest is also in mental health. So I have these orange socks and they're actually called depression socks. Um, they are used by the Danish Association of Depression on uh, World International Depression Day because depression does suck. And these depression socks are used by several different people, um, people in the media. And so to make awareness about depression and the problem and it is. And the reason that I do have this is I do suffer from depressions. Uh, I'm well medicated, so which means that most of the time I can actually have a proper life, even with a depression. But it's something that has been on my mind a lot. And it's something that I look into is how do we take care of our mental health at work? Um, I have a picture of me hugging someone, and that's because I think we don't see each other enough. We don't pay enough attention to each other. Um, and I'm also a big hugger. Um, and, and part of that for me is the part about seeing each other. And now we don't have that opportunity. Um, the picture I have is of uh, me and my friend Morgan Olström, because he and I uh, started two years ago, oh, two years ago actually, at Spotify, um, while we were introducing psychological safety into a tribe. And since then we have kept working on this. So right now we are working on a, or creating a two-day training. We have a one-day training on psychological safety. We're doing talks about it. Um, so it's something that's been a huge interest for me because I believe that having psychological safety and good mental health is part of what helps us at work. I have my Twitter ID there. Beware that I do tweet a lot, um, at least sometimes. Um, but feel free to follow me there. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do a very, very short introduction to psychological safety. And then I'm going to talk about our situation today, working from home, being at home during this pandemic. And I'm going to talk about how it affects our mental health. Uh, I will end up with some of the things we can actually do about this. And I will also mention some of the good stuff that has come during this time. Um, I will send the slides when I'm done with them. And there are loads of links where you can read more about this, where you can read the articles behind some of the stuff that I'll be referencing. So starting out with psychological safety. So psychological safety is very important because it helps us do more at work and in our personal life. It helps us be who we are and it also helps us do the things we need to um, make good products. But more importantly, it also helps us speak up about mistakes. Some of the areas where we have seen there is low psychological safety are places like Boeing, where people actually knew there were problems uh, with the planes, but they were afraid to speak up because they would be bullied or fired. So low psychological safety can mean that people don't speak up about the things that are happening. 
So psychological safety has been around as a term since the 60s, 1960s. Um, and it's become very much something we talk about the last five, 10 years after uh, more people started looking into it, and especially after Google started talking about it. So psychological safety is being able to show and employ oneself without fear of negative consequence of self-image stages or career. So this means we are open to talk about ideas, we are open to be who we are, but we are also open to making mistakes and being vulnerable because if we feel safe, we believe that we do not, we don't want to have any kind of repercussion, whether that is being bullied, being fired, being ridiculed, there's a lot of things that we are afraid of. And this psychological safety, I think, is even more necessary sometimes when we are working from home. So one of the things, for instance, is right now I am standing here speaking to a screen and a camera. I can't see any people. Um, and that is really, really weird. A lot of people get very self-conscious when they have a camera. Some people might not want to have the camera open uh, when they have meetings um, because they don't feel comfortable sharing their home for many reasons. Some people might not have a home that they want to show off. Some people feel very self-conscious when they're looking at a camera. Maybe they have really bad bandwidth. We don't all have good bandwidth so that we can be on talks like this. So this was the very short introduction. Um, there's a link to a TED talk uh, by Amy Edmondson, and you can always contact me if you want to know more as well. So if we look at our world now, we still have the pandemic. When, when this started, most people, I think, at least me, thought this would be a few weeks, maybe a month, but it's not. And it seems to continue. I created this talk two months ago. And even though we are starting to open up in a lot of areas, it is still quite relevant. Also, because we see a lot of areas having to close down again. So basically, what we see right now is we see all these scientists talking about the disease. How are things working? How are things not working? Sadly, we also see very non-scientists talking about how this is working and how um, it is created by alien DNA or it is uh, conspiracy theories. But we get so much information about this. We see so many charts about how these things are. I think there are very few people who follow the news who can't uh, draw pictures of the curse. We talked about the pandemic. But we get so much information and yet or rather we get a lot of data, but not all of it is information. So we just have so much in our head and that's what it's like now. We don't know about the future because even though it feels like we are opening up now, we see areas in Spain, for instance, clo closing down again. We see um, areas in Romania closing down again here in Europe. We see some states in the US closing down again. So we don't really know about the future. We don't know if there will be a second or a third wave. So there's a lot of insecurity connected to all these things. And one of the things we actually like as humans is to know what's going to happen. We don't need to know details. Well, some people do need to know details. Um, but for most people, they don't like this insecurity, like what is going to happen? How are we going to plan? Can we plan work? Can we plan traveling? We don't know right now. So that is part of the world we are living in. and. At least in our industry, most people are involuntarily working from home. Um, I, the far as I've seen, it's worked quite well in a lot of areas because we are used to having a few meetings online. There are good tools we can use and bad tools we can use. But we are working from home and all of a sudden we are sitting in front of a screen all day. So that means that we kind of need to focus on that screen. We might not be moving enough. and we have to find new ways to collaborate. We need to have, find new ways to work together in our teams if we are working in teams. And we need to pay more attention because the bandwidth is a lot smaller. Most of the time when we are on a screen, we see a very limited picture of the person who is at the other end, even if it's just one person, which means that most body language will be removed. But even small nuances of... Um, you know, how are you turning your head? How are you, are you smiling? What are you doing? So there's a lot of things that we can't see and that we can't hear. There might be tiny delays. There, there's an article in there about why you get so tired uh, being on Zoom. 
uh, which doesn't necessarily only um, mean Zoom. But one of the things is that there is a tiny delay in which doesn't have to be very big before we see it as something that our brain, or rather we don't see it, but our brain needs to adapt to that, which means that our brain is busy adapting, trying to make what we see um, fit with what we are hearing. And that is actually quite straining for our brain. And there's the other part of it. There's some of the mental part of it, for instance, maybe, like I said before, maybe you don't like to be on camera. Maybe you don't like to see yourself. Maybe you don't want to show your home. Maybe you don't have the opportunity to create backgrounds. Like I can't have a background on my computer um, unless I buy a green screen because my computer can't pull it. Uh, so there's a lot of things where you might not feel comfortable with that. Also, um, because we are missing out on things, because a lot of our communication all of a sudden uh, becomes in writing or at least limited to the meetings that we have, we are missing out on things. And what might work um, and create safety when we are sitting in a room together, like a small joke, can be something totally different when you have it in writing. You can um, go like, what did they actually think? You know, there wasn't a smiley after that. So was that serious or not? So there's a lot of things that becomes harder for us. Um, and even though um, we kind of have the technical things for working at home, we are still forced to be at home. Sometimes we will have people around us that we need to adapt to. And sometimes we won't. And, we, and it's not a choice that we made. For some people, they actually work more effectively from home. Um, and that is, of course, good. But there's still a difference between working remote and working remote being forced to be home. Even people who are used to working remote all the time talk about these things. So that's something we need to be aware of. And then some are alone. Right now, I am vacationing in Denmark. Well, vacationing, I've been here for six weeks. But before that, I was staying in Stockholm. And even though we were allowed to go out, we were allowed to see each other. Often we didn't. I used to be going to cafes once a week at least. I used to be going to work every day, meeting with people. And all of a sudden from March, we were working from home. It also turns out that the small encounters that we have, for instance, on our way to work, the, the place where you always buy your coffee, for instance, or the people who take the same subway as you and that you nod or smile at, those actually also met, matter for our mental health. But what happens with a lot of people who are living on their own is they become totally alone because they don't see their friends. I mean, some countries have been in total isolation, other countries have not, but even in countries where people have not been in isolation, what I see is that people are not seeing each other as much. Every time you have a small cough or something, you kind of, you try to be careful. And since a lot of my friends in Sweden, for instance, have small kids, that means that they often have a small cough or a sneeze or something, which means that we take care of each other and we don't see each other. Um, and that is not good for us, especially if you are an extrovert. If you're an extrovert, you need that contact with people. But even a lot of people who are introvert um, struggle with this about not meeting other people. The other part of this is, of course, that some people are totally not alone, ever. In a lot of countries, they're still homeschooling, which means that you have your kids at home or maybe daycare is not there. Maybe you have a partner at home. You need to have meetings and even though you have a home office, you might not have a home office where there's actually room for more people. You have, you know, kids coming in. And even though we talk to kids about this, I had a friend where someone said, uh, her, her manager said to her, just tell your daughter mom is working now not to disturb you. And that's all fine. But that just doesn't work with a four-year-old. She's not going to just go, oh, yeah, mom is working. I'm not going to disturb her. So many of our meetings, uh, at least many of the meetings I've been in, there's been, you know, um, a child sitting on the lap of someone in the meeting. Um, and we can, of course, accommodate for that. But it's still something that disturbs us. It's still something that puts small disturbances in, which uh, allows us um, 
or doesn't allow us to focus all the time. Plus, sometimes we can't work at the same times as we normally do. If you have to homeschool your kids, that is often during the day, and then maybe you have to work in the evening. But then what happens with the teams that you are actually supposed to work with? And even if you can say that you do have the advantage of being with people compared to people who are single, you are also with the same people all the time. And that that can be good for some people. I know some people who love this, who kind of like, I spent so much more time with my family. And I know other people who kind of like, I love my family, but not 24 seven. I need to see someone else. And who've had to go in and say, I need to take a walk every single day on my own because otherwise I don't have the energy to, to help my kids be in the, in the place where they need to be. And for a lot of us, the days become the same. We have breakfast, we work, we have lunch, we work, we have dinner, we watch Netflix, we sleep, we repeat. All the, Our brain is very good at remembering things, but it's also very lazy, which means that if there's nothing of importance, that is not something that is very active in our memory. For kids, they if you look at kids, they learn something new all the time. And because they're learning something new all the time, the days can be really long because they have new input that they need to take in. But for us, a lot of the things that we do are routine. But if you go take the subway to work, there will be different people on the subway. You will have to look at the crossing uh, when you pass the road. There's a lot of things that you do. So what happens when you don't have things that break? Um, You can come into this where you kind of go, oh, what day is it today? So when I found this out, I was, so I had this thing where I would do every Saturday, I would do egg and bacon in the morning. And what I would do is I would take out the bacon on Friday evening from my freezer because I like to buy it when it's on sale. Um, And one day I was doing this and kind of like, didn't I just do that? And when I started kind of looking at my calendar, I could tell that it was a week ago. But there is this feeling of kind of like, what day is it? What month is it? It just all flows together because we don't have those specific things that help us distinguish between them. Um, And that can also be really, really draining for us uh, because we go into this kind of vacuum of of where do we live. Um, So everything is online. We have relaxation online. We have parties online. We have training online. We have conferences like this. And on one hand, that is amazing because that means that we can actually talk to other people. I mean, if this had happened 20 years ago, we would not have the same opportunities to actually meet people, to attend a conference, to have, you know, uh, one of the things I do, I have regular meetings or Zoom meetings uh, with some of my friends in San Diego where we talk about meditation techniques, for instance. That would not be an option 20 years ago. And that is, of course, good. But the problem is twofold. One is that it's a screen. So we still have limited, even if you have a big screen, you still have a limited space that you can look into. Um, There is no physical contact, which a hugger like me likes, for instance. And the other part of it is there is no boundaries. You can actually find a training or a conference or whatever every single hour of the day. There's so much exciting stuff going on, which also means that it's sometimes it can be hard to choose or we choose too much because, oh, there's this really interesting thing that I always wanted to attend and now I actually can. So all of a sudden we jump and we attend all these things. And that can be something that also drains our brain. And focus becomes hard because things are the same We are struggling, a lot of us. We have to pay extra attention. So what happens sometimes is that our brain just becomes blank because it's really, really hard to focus. Some people say that it is easy to focus and that they work harder. But for most people I talk with, they struggle really with this focus. because And one of the reasons is there are all these options. That is the same. And then you kind of have to whip yourself into shape. You have to be the one making sure that you're doing things because you are not sitting with your team. Um, And a lot of people work too much. 
So I've heard some people say, yeah, but we're getting so much more done when we are working from home. Um, and, and Matt was saying on Twitter that, yes, part of that when you work remote is this is something I can control. I cannot control the pandemic. I cannot control what's going on in the world, but I can control my work. And that is what I will do. And several of the people I talk with who are used to working alone are telling me that they always make an extra effort to be seen because they want to make sure that the people who are not working remote know that they're doing enough. And um, that means that we will also be doing these things. The people are, so I'm not used to working remote and I hate working remote, but I also need to be aware, like, do I need to make an effort to make myself seen so that my client knows that I'm actually working on these things? Um, I have a good client. There's a lot of trust, so I haven't had that problem. But many people have seen that all of a sudden the trust company that they worked in has become a micromanagement company where managers need to check, are people actually working enough? Are they doing what they can? So that creates this kind of, a cycle of people working too much. Some people are afraid of losing job and a lot of people have lost job during this pandemic. Um, so that also often means that we work too much. The thing that I'm thinking about is, are we then working? So what kind of work are we doing? Because one thing that happens is that when you're sitting with your team, you can produce something and maybe you can produce it faster. But what about that serendipity? What about when you're standing at the coffee machine and somebody next to you is talking about something, you go, oh, wait, we are also working on that. Maybe we should coordinate. Or uh, you are overhearing things uh, from other team members that you might not be working with at that moment. One of the, the guys that I'm working with uh, says he loves working from home because he doesn't like public transportation. It drains him, and now he doesn't have to. But at the same time, he misses sitting next to his team and hearing what's going on, even in the discussion that he's not a part of, because he has a much better overview of what's going on with the work that he's doing. And at the same time, he um, he can contribute with the things that he knows. So are we working on the right things? Are we developing new things? I don't know. Um, but I do know that a lot of people have been working too much during the pandemic. So some people say uh, Maslow's a pyramid of needs is fake, and maybe it is, but with most models, they are useful in some way. And I think that one of the thing that is happening with this is that our physical safety is actually at stake here. Um, in some areas, like I live in Denmark or Sweden, you are not going to be thrown out. You're not going to have to be on the street. There are places you can get help. But there are literally people thrown on the street so you don't have the physical safety. You can't control if you get sick or not. You can take precautions, but you can't control it. So there's a lot of this physical things, a lot of the safety, having a home, putting food on the table, that is at stake for a lot of us. And that is something that really strains. That's something that can strain our mental health, but it can also strain the safety that we have. Because even if we used to feel that this was safe and could speak up, maybe... Before this, it was okay if you got fired because you could just find a new job, but now you can't be sure. So there's a lot of this going on, and it's it's quite low level, and I think that it's draining a lot of us. Uh, personally, I, I broke down three times during this pandemic so far, um, and part of it is me being alone, not having anyone to communicate with who's not on a screen. I have gone up to 20 days without speaking to another person who was not on a screen. And that is really draining for me. And of course, there's also good stuff. I mean, we can work from home. We do have the opportunity to work from home. Uh, we have internet. We have all these things. We can actually work from home, at least the people in our industry. There are a lot of people who can't work from home. You have more time with your family because you don't travel as much. You don't have to commute to work. And maybe you are used to going to conferences like I am. You have to travel or travel for work in general. And we do have the world at our hands, literally, because so many things are online. Um, another interesting thing is that a recent survey shows 
that prematurely born babies are down 90%, 90% in Denmark during the pandemic. And we are talking the babies who are born way before you go on maternity leave. We are talking babies that might be too small to even fit in a hand. That has gone down 90%. So it also gives us something to think about, you know, when you are pregnant, for instance, what are you doing to your body that creates these early births? Birth, oh, I can't say the births. Um, what are we doing different now that makes this go down? And there's a lot, tons of creativity. Uh, there was some good news that was running for eight weeks. There's a link to that as well. There's a lot of fun TikTok. Um, the link that, or the picture that's on the right is a picture of different actors reenacting Princess Bride. And if you haven't seen Princess Bride, you should, but also consider afterwards watching Princess Bride, the home edition, where actors from all over um, are putting in lines um, and, and doing the scenes, just cutting from one to the other. Very funny. So there is good stuff like that. And I think that part of the good stuff that's also there is we can start thinking about how we are working. What happens when we go back? Do we remember to take some of the good stuff back? Or do we just go back to working like crazy, which is not good for us? Um, so some of the things we can do um, to help ourselves, I think the problem with those is that can be really hard to do because you kind of have to pull yourself up. But the most important thing, I think, is to be kind also to yourself. So being kind to the people you are working with Maybe have a little bit more patience with people if that is possible, because a lot of us are on the strain. Maybe you would feel safe doing something before that you don't feel safe enough now. And to the opposing part, that can feel like, oh, you don't trust me anymore. But try and be kind and realize that a lot of us are in a difficult situation. So if you look at what you can do for yourself, part of what you can do is eating healthy. There's so many jokes around about, you know, how much weight people gained or how much uh, people started drinking, for instance. Um, the hotlines for alcoholism have been huge during this time. Um, part of it, of course, is also because people can't hide it as much anymore when there's someone home all the day. But some people are drinking too much and some people are eating too much. So try to eat healthy. Um, it's so easy. One of the things I've been doing is like going out to the fridge and seeing if something new came in since the last time I looked there. That's so easy to do when you're working. Remember to take enough breaks. We are not very good at focusing. And plus, when we do this really deep focus down to a screen, it's not good for our brain. So make sure you take enough breaks. Move away from the computer, preferably go for a walk or something. Move from time to time. Um, I am living with, among others, a 19-year-old girl, and she actually told that one of the boys from her school had a blood cloth in his leg because he was in his room for three days playing computer games, and his mother brought him the food. So all that he did was go to the bathroom and back. Um, so he had a blood cloth in his leg. So we need to move from time to time, preferably going for a walk, going outside, taking care of yourself. And watch your sleep habits. It, Sleep is really important, um, and that is also one of the things that is affected now. It's important for, for our mental health, in many, no matter what kind of mental health we're talking about. And maybe limit intake of news, especially if you're very worried about all these things. It's so easy to just sit and read the news all the time. Read the news about what's going on with Black Lives Matter. Read the news what's going on with the pandemic. Read the news about kids not getting vaccinated because of all this, uh, people not going to their checkups. One of the things we see in Denmark is that people come in with a later stage of cancer because they don't go to the checkups. And that is not good news. So try to limit all that. And of course, be kind to yourself. Know that you are under stress and that is okay to feel tired, to Take a break, maybe take some days off if that is possible because you need it. If we look at how we're working with other people, one of the things I think we need to do and that I've seen some teams do but not all 
is create new working agreements. What does it mean for us now that we are working from home all the time? What does it mean for us if we are um, homeschooling, for instance? What, how do we need to work? How comfortable are we um, seeing each other? One of the things uh, they've done at, at uh, some of the teams I work with is they write um, statuses in Slack. So they will go like, I, I'm into work now, or I'll go for a break, or I'm going for a coffee. Because those are things that you would see if you were in the office, but now you don't. So kind of that is one of their new working agreements. But figure out what works for you, especially around how you communicate. Because we are removing so much of the bandwidth in communication, you need to be very explicit about how do we communicate um, now that we are working remote. And then talk about it, because it's not going to go away just because we don't talk about it. So if you're feeling that this is a problem, have a discussion about it. Have a cup of coffee and saying, you know what, oh, um, this is really making me unfocused. Or you're saying, you know what, I love working from home. I never, ever want to go back to work. Have those discussions so that people can see that there are other people feeling the same way. The first time I did this talk, when I was reading the chat afterwards, one of the things that I noticed was how many times people wrote, it's like she's looking into my head. It's like she um, has seen what I'm seeing. So knowing that other people are in a similar or a different situation is very important for um, the way we work together. And be empathic. Know that we are all in different situations and we all have different struggles. And, and be empathic to other people. Listen to them and know that they're doing the best they can. So be kind to them. And make it okay to be in a bad place. Maybe you have a really terrible day because you had your kids home all day yesterday and you didn't get any sleep. That's okay. Make it okay to be in a bad place, whether it's that or you're just stressed from being home alone. But that doesn't mean you're not responsible for your actions. So if you're having a really bad day, you yell at people. Um, that is one thing, but then apologize the next day. Because just because you're feeling bad doesn't mean you can do anything you want. You are still responsible for your actions. So this is very small, and I'm just showing it because it is in the slides. This is actually a letter from the Canadian government who was sent out to people about this is how it is, how you're working from home, how you're under stress. So this is a good example of a company handling it. Um, now I'm going to end and go with the question. I'm just going to show you the next slide so you can see that you're free to contact me. There is my email. There is LinkedIn, Sing. Um, and then there's a bunch of links here that you can go into. But for now, we're going to move on to questioning. All right. Great. Thank you, Gitte. If you don't mind, yes, unsharing your slides. I am on my way and I'm going to change my camera. Yeah, people can see us now much better as the slides are gone. We actually have a few questions already in the chat and I would invite people to continue putting questions in there. I will be monitoring them and I just go through the questions one by one, like first in, first out. So whoever is in there first, gets to ask the first. Question. Now, the very first one came from Rick. And Gitta, um, Rick was asking, in this pandemic, since we all work from home now, what we are concerned about is that we don't see the people that need support, help, and attention. Any tips on how to allow them to feel safe to reach out? Do you have any tips regarding that? And somehow you are gone. <laughs> Gitte? Sorry, I just got kicked out. <laughs> no problem. Did you hear what I asked as a question? I can't hear you. You can't hear me? That's one of those regular things that comes up in any video conference. I can't hear you. You're on mute. So can you hear me now? Okay, um, I'm just going to go out and in again because I can't hear what you're saying. Okay, I'll wait for you just a second. So, 
Even in our third run, these things happen. So waiting for Gide to get back on. You might use the time to already provide some feedback. Sorry about that. Now, can you hear me now, Gide? I can, yeah. Perfect. So let's go to the very first question that was asked by Rick. Um, and his question was, in this pandemic, since we all work from home now, what we are concerned about is that we don't see the people that need support, help, and attention. Do you have any tips on how to allow them to feel safe in order to reach out? I think that's a good question. I think when you are in the office, it's so much easier to notice, you know, if somebody who usually speaks a lot is not speaking um, or something like that. So I think that one of the things you need to try to do is be aware of signals like that still. So, um, and... I think if you want to make it safe for people to speak up about things, it's a good idea to be a role model. It's a good idea to be the first one to show that vulnerability and say, um, I have not been feeling well today. Um, would it be okay if, if I just use a few minutes to tell you how I feel? Um, and that can mm -hmm. be part of that creating safety or um, repeating again and again, if anyone needs to talk, I am available. Um, I do see what's happening now that we're working online is that I don't get as many approaches from people at work as I did when I was physically in the space because it's so much easier to go over to someone and go like, do you want to go for a cup of coffee? Um, but if there is someone where you're kind of thinking there might be something going on, maybe do that, have that co coffee with them and have a one-on-one -on -one meeting um, and just chit chat about anything and listen to them because Sometimes it takes time for people to open up, but mm -hmm. taking that time to listen to them um, and, and let them know that you care about them and that it's okay to not be okay. Mm -hmm. And do you feel that um, time that it takes for people to open up, that, it, that this becomes longer and more difficult in the virtual context compared to a face-to-face -face context? I mean, I, I have my own perspectives on this, but I'd like to get yours on that. I think it's, it's actually quite different. Um, like one of the people that I'm working with, um, they are actually much more going much more deep and much more intense in our one-on-ones, talking about some of the struggles that they have at work, stuff that they would never talk about when we were working in the office. Um, mm. So I think for some people, the safety of, um, and they also don't have the camera on, the safety of, of being there and kind of just having someone so focused to themselves it makes them speak up more. But I also mm -hmm. do see people who don't feel comfortable speaking up about these things. Um, and again, what I've seen is that once someone starts speaking up, it becomes easier for others. Yeah. Um, I have a product owner who struggles with anxiety and had really bad anxiety attacks. Um, so he and I were working on it for a week and then he decided to talk about it in, in his team and go like, I realized that I am so worried about if I'm doing enough to provide um, the environment that you need to do your best work. So I need much more um, explicit feedback because usually I can walk around and, and notice if somebody needs help. So having that vulnerability, but I find that people are not as speaking up as much um, when it's online. Yeah. Okay. So basically giving the permission to speak, leading by example, all of those things that are also relevant in an in-person setting. Yeah. But uh, they, they even might become more relevant in an online setting. Now, let's go to the next question coming from Zora. He was asking that, so he was saying, companies mostly think that this, that it is up to their employees to take care of their own mental health. Therefore, companies do not pay enough attention to mental health of their employees. His question for you, Gitta, uh, is uh, what activities should companies provide or do in order to secure good mental health for their employees. You gave this example with the Canadian uh, federal government. Maybe you have a few more tips and tricks out there. Yeah, so one of the things that I've seen um, in some companies is the awareness of it, for instance. Um, there, there is a thing called Mental um, Health Awareness Week. And I've been in one company where what they did was they actually asked people who had any kind of mental um, challenge, whether that was... Um, they had people who had depressions, who had stress, um, who were bipolar, uh, who had anxiety to make a poster. And then they would have posters around the company 
where they would talk about these things or they would invite people in to do talks. One of the talks that I do, for instance, is about stress and depression. And that is something that I find that once people start figuring out that this is a thing, so invite in people like this, but also just acknowledging um, so that the managers are trained in, in looking out for these things and acknowledging that this is a thing. I mean, mental health is not just for people who have problems. It's not just for people who have a diagnosis. I mean, that's one thing. We need to take care of people who, who do have that and maybe uh, make sure that they can still work in the best environment. But like, for instance, during this, people who are perfectly healthy, mentally normal, are still being put under a lot of strain by, for instance, having to work from home or having to see yourself on a camera and stuff like that. And I do think that companies need to speak up about this mm -hmm. and need to speak up about how important it is. Another thing that I've seen is that um, in the UK, for instance, there is an education called mental health first aid, where some companies have educated people in mental health first aid. It doesn't mean that these people are therapists, but it does mean that if you struggle with your mental health, you can go to this person and they can help you figure out who to go to or if you need to talk to your manager. Or um, if you do have the money for it in your company, having access to helplines. So that's one thing I've se seen very much now I'm working with Swedish television um, is that they actually have a helpline and at least every second week it is in the newsletter from the management. Make sure that if you are struggling, you can call this helpline 24 hours a day and they will help you whether it's you need to talk once or you need to have more support. And then if they open up to you, remember to be open and listening and not just going, well, just pull yourself together or, you know, how bad can it be? But actually acknowledging that this is a thing. Because I think it's very essential. I think good mental health is essential to feel safe. Because if you don't have good mental health, if you keep being strained, that is also going to make you feel less safe. Even though the safety may um, objectively be the same, you might not feel as safe, which means that you might not come up with that good idea that's going to make that awesome product that we need. So I think it's a huge benefit for the companies as well. But they still need to learn this. Absolutely. And and one point you mentioned that mental health is not only for those people that have mental health issues. Yeah. It's the same with physical health, right? You shouldn't be thinking about physical health only once you get sick, but you try. You should try to prevent it to also yeah. be the best version of yourself, to be able to deliver and do great stuff, not only at work, but also in the in the circles that, that you're working with or that you're, that you're dealing with, right? Exactly. Now, the next one from Angel. Um, he was writing, do you think that some companies will use this crisis to save cost, electricity, heating, internet, forcing people to work from home? This can cause that some people that are not earning enough will have to carry with extra costs like electricity, etc., at home and could create some extra stress. How to deal with that? So first of all, do you see that happening and how would you deal with that or what kind of tips do you have? Yeah, I already see it happening. I see some companies who are going to look, we're never going to back, back to working um, I heard, I think it was Cap Gemini in the Netherlands who were kind of going like, now the offices are just going to be for people when they have workshops and stuff like that. The rest is going to be working from home because people are mostly consultants. Um, so I do think a lot of companies are going to kind of take the, the chance to, or whatever we call it, to go in and say, we can actually save. We don't need as many um, desks. We don't need as much offices. And I think that in some cases, yes, you can say maybe the people who want to work from home or maybe you can, um, you know, there are some things that are beneficial. It also depends on what you work with. But I do believe a lot of the people in our industry, no matter if you work in a team or not, we benefit from each other. We benefit from having access to each other. And no matter how good we are at it, there is still this extra barrier when you need to call someone. Um, but I do, I do already see companies going in and saying, you know what, we're just going to work from home. Um, I don't know what, what to do about it. I think there's a problem in, like in some countries, there are laws about this. So like in Sweden, if you require your people to work from home, you need to provide them with a proper working environment. Uh, so chairs and stuff like that. But I do think it's a problem because if you don't have that kind of company or those kind of laws, Maybe just the fact, you know, having a proper webcam or sitting on a chair, and that's going to 
that's going to provide extra costs for people. Um, I'm not sure electricity is going to be so much for an individual person, but it might be. And even if it isn't, there's just the fact that maybe you have food at, at work. You need to take care of food at home. There's a lot of things, stationary, all these things, and it adds up, especially if you don't have a lot of money. So if your company is um, is forcing you to work from home this way, I would go into a dialogue about them as kind of like, so how are you going to help me be the best worker I can be under these conditions? Yeah. Um, and kind of saying, you know what, I can't afford a proper working environment, which means I might get more sick days because I don't have a proper chair. Is that something we can find out to kind of go into a discussion about this? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, as a business owner, it would never occur to me to say, oh, you stay at home and everything else is the same. But it would always be the question, if we do stay, what does that mean for us as, mm -hmm. as employees, but also as the business? And to what extent, I mean, the business is going to save a lot of money. Like, to what extent are we going to distribute that to our employees so that they can either, like, rent bigger apartments or, like, provide them with good working environments? So I think this is this is a very important conversation to have. And I think many organizations, large and small, will be impacted by this. Now, we have a few more minutes. Let's try to hit as many questions as possible. And Mateja was the next one asking a question. So, first of all, he was thanking you for so much for this eye-opening talk. And how do we balance our fight for the climate, since a lot of people don't have to drive or fly to work anymore, and our social needs? Is there a silver lining? <laughs> I think there is some silver line. One of the things we can see is that some of the you know, environmental effects have gone down, less pollution. But sadly, I think that um, there's a lot of the structural things that need to change before we can take proper care of the environment. What we have done now by, by not flying, by not taking cars and stuff like that, is sadly only a fragment of what needs to be done. We need to go in and we need to um, you know, take care of the structural things, like how we get heat and all these things. That is something we still need to fight for. How do we balance this with the social? I think that um, we need to be aware, of course, do we just fly somewhere to meet someone? Um, but I think we can also you know, go out and see people without it having to be at this. Maybe we don't see people in person 10 times a year, maybe we see them in person twice a year and we have more Zoom calls or whatever we do. So I think we can find that balance. Uh, but I also think we need to do something to raise this problem because what we have seen now is that just staying home and not flying and not using cars is not enough. We need to do a lot more about the way we have um, the power like electricity and heat in the world um, and taking care of our garbage, of course. Yeah, and food consumption. I mean, yeah. ag agriculture, especially meat production, is around 30% of all CO2 emissions in the world. And that's that's a fairly simple one to, to fix. So Gitte, we close right on time as we have a fixed time box. Thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure. And you've already triggered a lot of conversations. I, you did not manage to go through the chat while you were speaking, but I encourage you to do that. And there is actually like, I think one or two questions left. If you have time, if you have uh, like uh, the ability, the availability, Maybe you can answer those questions in there. Thanks cool. again for joining us. It was great to host you, and I'm sure we'll see each other fairly soon again, either virtually or maybe in person. Thank you for having me.